All right, you're all set. Excellent. Thank you, Athena. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> So we do have an attendee. Okay. Um, okay, so it is, uh, and Dave Zomak has joined. Welcome, Dave. Thank you, hello. Hello. So it is 2.01 p.m. and I am going to call this meeting of the Community Resources Committee of the Town Council to order. This is the May 19th. 2020 meeting. It is virtual. Um, we do have a quorum. According to Governor's Baker's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, MGL chapter 30A section 20, that order allows us to hold this virtual meeting of the Community Resources Committee. This meeting is being recorded for future broadcast and all votes taken will be by roll call. At this time, I will call upon each committee member by name. Um, to confirm that you can hear me and we can hear you, please remember to mute your mic after saying present and unmute your mic before saying present. Um, Shalini Balmilne. Present. Mandy Jo Haneke is present. Evan Ross. Present. Sarah Swartz. Present. And Steve Schreiber is not present right now. We expect him to join the meeting in about 30 minutes. Committee members, there's no chat room for this meeting. If you have technical dis issues, please let Athena know. Um, and to make a comment or ask a question, please click the raise hand button. And if we run into technical difficulties, hopefully we will not, like last night, um, myself, if it's not me running into difficulties, we'll decide how to proceed. <laughs> Discussion could be suspended and the minutes would note the disconnection. Um, now we will be moving on. Let's skip my agenda up. Our agenda is we will be moving on to general public comment at this time. The public is welcome to comment on matters within the jurisdiction of the Community Resources Committee. Residents are welcome to express their views for one to three minutes. Um, and we will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during public comment. To participate in public comment, please, if you joined the Zoom meeting on the internet, please use the raise hand button. If you joined the Zoom meeting through the telephone, please press star nine to indicate that you would like to make a public comment. Um, at this time, I am seeing one, two, two hands at this time for public comment. I will recognize your name and then what I will do is I will un allow you to talk and unmute you and then you will have to confirm the unmute in order to speak when when I do recognize you please state your name and your address for the person taking the minutes which is Angela Mills thank you Angela um, at this time I'm going to recognize Christina Scarinch um, you may unmute yourself and begin your public comment yes thank you uh, my name is Christina Scarinch and I'm uh, here for Animal Defenders and our many Massachusetts supporters. I'm not a resident, but I'm speaking for our Massachusetts supporters with thanks to the committee uh, for its consideration of agenda item 3A. That's the local measure to address cruel and dangerous traveling animal acts. We've worked on this issue throughout the US and around the world, including on the proposed state measure for Massachusetts. We've provided you extensive data in our written testimony and we're happy to answer any questions regarding that data or any of the texts that we've worked on throughout the US, including the federal bill. Most Americans now oppose traveling wild animal acts, more than 46 diverse nations, at least three US states, and more than 100 local US jurisdictions have already acted, including 11 towns, <coughs> excuse me, 11 towns, Massachusetts. There's a bipartisan federal bill and at least seven state bills in play at the moment. Prevailing science makes clear these animals are inherently unsuited for this business model. One comprehensive study we sent you considered the latest science in the industry worldwide, concluding that for circus animals this is no life worth living, and that any education or conservation role would likely be marginal and outweighed by the negative impression generated by using wild animals for entertainment. It also raised concerns that we know little to nothing about how or how many animals are sourced, bred, traded, how they die, or what happens once they're no longer used. Federal oversight is complex and costly, and by the agency's own admission, it's just not working. States often rely on the mere existence of federal licensure, despite longstanding repeated 
OID criticisms regarding oversight failures. The National Association of Public Health Veterinarians has warned that there is no federal law addressing pathogen transmission risk at venues where the public has contact with animals, advising that certain exotic and wild animals should be banned from these settings altogether. Federal oversight does not consider public safety. That's left to you and to local first responders. Yet local authorities often lack the funding familiarity of facilities to deal with these species. Local law enforcement is often surprised to find out that it's been left in their laps. Using animals this way teaches us nothing about what it means to be wild. Rather, the science shows that these acts perpetuate misconceptions that fuel trade and trafficking, which harm wild populations. To present wild animals on a leash or a chain for photos or petting perpetuates misconceptions that endanger humans, the individual animal, and wild populations. True conservation demands that we teach future generations what a wild animal really is, and that is not a plaything or a prop for entertainment or selfie clickbait. They are wild and will seek to be free and follow their natural instincts. Thank you for your consideration, and we hope that you consider animals and Amherst families to be on these cruel acts. Thank you, Christina. Um, next, we are going to recognize John Page. So John, um, unmute your mic um, and you have three minutes. Can you hear me? We can. All right, so this is John Page, 683 East Pleasant Street, but speaking today in my capacity uh, representing the Amherst Area Chamber of Commerce. Um, this is regarding the expedited um, permitting and I just want to read a statement that we put together. The temporary zoning amendment put forth by the planning and permitting staff is creative, innovative, and bold. It exemplifies responsive government, and just like our businesses are doing, it enables adaptability in these changing times. Uh, this is essential to sustaining the viability of our small businesses, specifically restaurants and retail. Um, we cannot underscore enough the gravity of the situation we're in. Multiple sources are calculating Amherst unemployment rate as exceeding 30%, and our largest employers, our institutions of higher ed, are implementing hiring freezes and beginning to make difficult budgetary decisions. Our smallest businesses are making decisions whether to fold or attempt to keep on going. Uh, we're in contact with our communities from all over the state and are learning how their communities are adapting. Outdoor dining, altering floor plans, and changing signage are critical parts of successful reopening. Currently, most of those changes would take up to as much as 70 days or more, as Mr. Moore detailed last night at the council meeting. Uh, this proposal empowers the town manager and staff to work with existing businesses to offer safer and solvent business models. And this includes, uh, also includes new businesses opening in this recovery period. Um, regarding the discussion of new businesses, that was brought up last night. Uh, we, face, we must face the reality that some businesses won't make it through this and that we have existing vacant space. If a business needs to radically change or a new business um, wants to come in, which will create jobs and generate tax revenue, we should not stand in their way. Uh, we implore you to work with fellow town council committees, the planning board and town staff to move this zoning amendment forward as quickly as possible. Once again, I want to emphasize that we need to plan now and have a process in place for when requests such as outdoor dining and retail sales do come in in the future. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, John. Um, we have another hand. Um, and so, oops. I will at this time recognize Gabrielle Gould. Hello all, uh, Gabrielle Gould, 34 Canton Avenue, Amherst, Mass, but today as a uh, representative of the Amherst Business Improvement District, as well as the Downtown Amherst Foundation. I don't want to waste anybody's time and let you get on with your day. We pretty much wrote everything that John just said, except in a different capacity and wording. So we second. John Page, and we thank you for the work that is being done, uh, Rob and Chris and from the town, and we thank the council and look forward to working with you to make this possible and to keep our businesses vital and thriving. Have a great day. Thank you, Gabrielle. Are there any, is there anyone else in attendance that would like to um, make a public comment? Uh, 
I am not seeing anyone. So we will move on to our presentation and discussion items at this time. This is item 3A on our agenda, and it is the first initial discussion on the bylaw banning the use of wild and exotic animals that was proposed to the town council. We have invited the three proponents um, that have Councillor Bal Milne, who is the councillor sponsor of this bylaw, to make a presentation today of 10 to 15 minutes or so, and then we will take 15 minutes or so for any questions for them. Um, and to also go through potentially the first two items on our community impact report to see if there's any uh, stakeholders that we need to or want to get in touch with as a committee to bring in for questions or ask specific questions. We'll see how far we get to get through that because we have other things on the agenda. So at this invite Rebecca Schwartz, Cheryl Becker, and Laura Hagen. You guys can unmute your mics. Um, and I believe Rebecca is going to start with a presentation and then pass it on to Cheryl and Laura. So welcome and thank you for coming. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I'm Rebecca Schwartz and I want to thank you for providing me time to present on behalf of the bylaw prohibiting the use of wild and exotic animals in traveling shows and circuses. <clears throat> People all over the world have become increasingly aware of the physical pain and emotional distress elephants, bears, chimpanzees, tigers, and other exotic animals must endure as unwilling participants, participants in this antiquated form of entertainment. These traveling shows are a relic of days gone by before we understood the sentient nature of these animals and the cruelty involved with training and harboring them. In addition, there is absolutely no educational or instructional value watching a majestic bear wear a tutu or forcing a lame elephant to give children rides. These circuses have not changed their business model to reflect society's changing awareness. There are numerous successful circuses nowadays, such as Cirque du Soleil and Big Apple Circus, which do not exploit animals and still provide circus entertainment. This mistreatment of circus animals, poor enforcement of inadequate laws and public safety are all considerations when evaluating the reasons for adopting this bylaw. There are unfortunately countless examples over the past hundred years about the mistreatment of circus animals. I find the stories of the elephants to be exceptionally poignant. Every circus performing elephant was stolen from the wild as babies, shipped across the oceans, and then trained to perform unnatural acts. There are currently 48 performing elephants left in the US. The passage of this bylaw will move them all one step closer to sanctuary. Laws protecting animals in traveling shows are inadequate and poorly enforced. For example, the USDA's records of the Comerford Zoo's elephant Beulah, who died last summer at the Big E, were spotty and incomplete. Abusive handling is correlated with aggression, and there are many recorded incidents of circus animals hurting people, either intentionally or not. And most relevant today, animals may carry disease. Last summer at the Amherst Farmers Market, I canvassed for a couple of days to see if residents had interest in this bylaw. I talked to over 150 residents and practically everyone that I talked to enthusiastically supported this bylaw. In fact, many people were surprised that Amherst didn't already have such a provision in place. As more and more towns are banning traveling exotic animal acts, the exhibitors are looking for new venues. If an exhibitor or event organizer wanted to bring an exotic animal act to town, they could. There is no bylaw stopping them. It is important to note this bylaw does not pertain to domestic animals and will not impact pony rides or petting zoos that currently take place in the town common. Enactment of this bylaw would make Amherst the 12th municipality in the Commonwealth to pass similar legislation. I have lived in many parts of the country and chose to settle and raise my family in the Amherst area because I appreciated the progressive culture of the town. My children now live far from home. They see the world through the lens of Amherst and they appreciate the values instilled in them. 
It is based on this pride of place that I am appealing to the town's ability to continue to evolve and make positive change towards mindfulness and compassion. If Amherst enacts this bylaw, the town will be adding to the collective voice for change, not just locally, but throughout the Commonwealth, the nation, and internationally. Thank you for your time and consideration of this bylaw. I realize there are many very pressing issues that the town is currently facing with the COVID crisis. Still, I implore you to move towards compassion for these animals that are not able to advocate for themselves. Thank you very much. Um, and now Cheryl Becker is going to speak. Um, we need to unmute you, Cheryl. You're, Hold on. you're mute, Cheryl. Oh, there you go. There we go. Oh, no, you're muted again. Okay. Sorry, I've never testified, never testified on Zoom before. This is a new experience. <laughs> oh, it's a little strange. So, hello. Um, thank you for allowing me to testify in support of the proposed bylaw banning wild animals and traveling shows and exhibits. I am Cheryl Becker, founder and president of Western Mass Animal Rights Advocates. Um, this is an opportunity for Amherst to show its compassion for our fellow creatures and join a growing movement across the country and within mass um, to ban such cruel and archaic practices. Um, I've been protesting in circuses and petting zoos with wild animals for the past 25 years and have seen with my own eyes the horrendous conditions in which animals are forced to live while on the road. I've also seen a lack of veterinary care they are given and lack of enforcement of state and federal regulations. In fact, last September was a perfect example of that. Um, as Rebecca mentioned, an, uh, an elephant at the Big E, Beulah, was forced to be on exhibit despite being seriously ill. She died at the Big E of septicemia due to pyometra, a uterine infection. But the necropsy revealed much more than just a cause of death. It revealed the pathetically weak state and federal standards for wild animals and traveling exhibits and the lack of enforcement. It also revealed that Cumberford Petting Zoo knew that Beulah had a deadly infection when they chose to transport her from Goshen, Connecticut to be exhibited for 17 days at the Big E. Septicemia is extremely painful for any species and it was quite clear looking at Beulah on day one that she was ill, yet no actions were taken. Um, in response to questions submitted by U.S. Senator Richard Blumenthal, the USDA stated that, quote unquote, appropriate veterinary care and intervention was administered, um, end quote, um, to Beulah prior her, to her death. Um, it is unconscionable that the USDA believes that forcing a seriously ill elderly elephant to stand all day long in such a stressful, unnatural environment for 17 days is acceptable. Um, it is, it is even more unconscionable that she was able to be at the Big E in that condition and that no authorities stepped in when they received pictures and complaints of her looking sickly the first two days and unable to stand on day three. Authorities should have conducted an immediate welfare check on her. Instead, they dismissed valid concerns about her health. So this tragedy symbolizes all that is wrong with the use of wild animals in entertainment. Instead of a life in their natural habitats, these incredible animals are being carted all across the country, confined in cramped spaces, and forced to perform or be on display for long periods of time. For 50 years, Beulah was enslaved at events throughout the Northeast with her two sister elephants shipped around like cargo from event to, to uh, event year round. All were torn from their families in the wild at a young age, shipped to the US, beaten into submission, and forced to perform and give rides using physical violence like painful bull hooks. They, just like every like other elephants in traveling exhibits, were confined to cramped trailers every day with very little, if any, fresh air, exercise, or socialization. Um, so the, her death highlights the urgent need for towns to pass a bylaw banning the use of wild animals in traveling acts and exhibits. And, um, as you know, you know, there's 11 other towns in Mass that have passed such an ordinance or bylaw. 
and I'm, I'm hoping the state will pass one too, but towns cannot sit around and wait until that happens to take action on their own. Because as you know, the state takes a lot longer to pass legislation than towns. Um, so there are also, um, there, there's also the Springfield Science Museum's wildlife exhibit, including a mountain, mounted elephant. And that is far more educational and exciting as it shows wildlife in their natural habitats. There are also educational videos uh, about wildlife nowadays. There's no educational value at all in seeing wild animals forced to do unnatural things in an unnatural environment. So um, education is no excuse. Um, so Comerford Petting Zoo has been cited by the USDA more than 50 times for Animal Welfare Act violations. They also have had five dangerous incidents, four of which were due to an elephant being spooked while giving rise to kids, causing injuries, requiring hospitalization. And there is also the risk of dangerous E. coli, tuberculosis, and other diseases which are easily contracted at petting zoos, even those with no violations. Um, so, you know, it's not just for the animals, but it's for human safety as well that I urge you to um, approve that the bylaw. And um, so we also, I, uh, I have another, a few, there's a few other incidents that happened at the Big E. Um, I, I know time is limited, but um, I'll try and make it very brief. Um, the, the weak and unenforced government regulations were proven um, yet again in 2008 at, at the Big E. An attendee took a picture of Minnie, now Comerford's sole surviving elephant, looking sickly while giving rides and limping, which went viral and sparked outrage. Shortly after, a video of a Comerford camel being abused there went, it went viral too, but no actions were taken and Minnie was forced to give rides last year despite documented incidents in which she attacked her handlers and members of the public. The regulations are clearly not being properly enforced and no agency monitors training sessions where the most violent abuses occur. And even when they are, businesses with lengthy lists of violations like Comerford, are, they don't lose their licenses, usually. So, um, we, we created a petition, my group created a petition asking the Big E to remove wild animals, and that gathered 149,000 signatures, reflecting the growing opposition to such needless cruelty. Um, so if, if Amherst enacts this bylaw, it will receive so much praise from local residents and hopefully be a role model for others, other local towns, such as Springfield, and maybe West Springfield someday. Um, so far, the only Western Mass towns that have passed, that has passed such a ban is Pittsfield. So um, we really need to get more towns in Western Mass on board. So um, I, uh, let's see, I'll try to wrap it up. All wild animals, uh, as you know, as I mentioned, spend um, extend, extended periods of time in cramped transport vehicles they suffer from lack of exercise and restriction of natural behaviors. And such abnormal conditions are unavoidable. Um, solitary animals get crowded together, family members are separated, and most tricks are coerced using bull hooks, electric prods, whips, metal bars, and methods most would view as torturous. So um, such cruel conditions make the animals prone to severe health, behavioral, and psychological problems. And um, the extreme stress caused by the environment they're in makes them often makes them wild, um, highly dangerous, especially with the public. Uh, deaths and injuries are not that uncommon. Um, Comerford, as I mentioned, has some injuries on their record. And as I mentioned, um, if you like, I can send you their records and the videos I mentioned. Um, so I'll wrap it up. <laughs> Um, thank you. Thank you all for your time and consideration of this bylaw, especially during these troubled times. Um, I hope you will follow in the other 11 Mass Towns footsteps and pass such a ban to end such archa archaic cruelty. And um, 
That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. I believe we're going to hear from Laura next. I do want to recognize that Steve Schreiber, our fifth committee member, has joined the meeting. Good afternoon. And Thank you for, oh, sorry. Steve's just ensuring that we heard him. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Laura Hagan. I'm the Massachusetts State Director for the Humane Society of the United States. I wanted to also offer my thanks um, for considering this ordinance uh, to Councillor Balmion for filing it um, and for all of you for taking it up during such a strange and unusual time for all of us. Um, I don't want to repeat um, what Cheryl and Rebecca and Christina already shared. Um, I think their testimony has been accurate and factual and compelling. You know, I think I just want to emphasize that, you know, cities and towns do have a very important role to play in policymaking when it comes to captive wildlife. Um, as Cheryl mentioned, 11 Massachusetts cities and towns have already passed ordinances. And I can tell you that, um, you know, I've been working on these issues for over over 10 years now. And I know that, um, you know, Ringling used to be a huge powerhouse. They came to Massachusetts every single year. And what finally convinced, or one of the things that finally convinced Ringling to stop touring with elephants, actually two things. One was the sentiment, um, the recognition of the sentiment that public opinion was changing on keeping these very sentient feeling uh, animals, wild animals uh, in circuses and traveling with them around the country. And the other piece of that was cities and towns across the country that had city, city and town councils that had stepped up and said, look, this is cruelty. Our federal government's not doing its job and oversight. Um, and so we're gonna say, you know, our doors are closed to these types of performances. And so even though there's not a circus that's currently coming to Amherst, um, the, the town's action on this can make a huge difference uh, for these animals. Because truly, you know, in Massachusetts, we do see there are certain areas like the Big E where circuses come practically every year. But then we also see them moving to other small areas throughout the state. So they don't necessarily just stay where they've been historically. And as more doors close, these circuses and traveling shows are looking for communities that are open in, um, for them to do business there. And I think that the, the testimony that folks have already provided, you know, shows you the type of uh, cruelty and mistreatment that you would be closing the door to. And as Cheryl mentioned, particularly with the Big E, but we've seen this with other uh, exhibitors that travel throughout Massachusetts. I, 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 I would struggle to name one exhibitor that comes to Massachusetts that hasn't been cited by the USDA for failure to provide care for their animals, very basic types of care, such as food and water, veterinary care, and or hasn't been cited by the USDA for failure to protect the public adequately. And, and um, you know, we, I could send you, I will send you and can send you more information with specific examples. Cheryl already named several. Um, but addition into those, addition to those failures to protect animals or the public, you know, especially in today's time when we're looking about the transmissibility of disease from animals to people, this is a big issue with animals and traveling shows and circuses. Elephants uh, are carriers for a human form of tuberculosis, and at least 12 and a half percent of circus elephants have tested positive for the human strain of tuberculosis. And that number may be actually quite low because it's very common to get a false negative on those tests. Um, primates carry a variety of different types of viruses, fungus, and bacteria that are transmissible to humans. And of course, these wild animals still are uh, rabies vector species. And wild animals, there's no rabies vaccine that is uh, made for these wild animals. And, and we've seen that in Massachusetts, where in the Brockton Fair, a young woman was bitten by I think it was a capuchin monkey, and she had to go seek medical care because that is a rabies vector animal. Um, and so, um, you know, this is another reason that local cities and towns can can take action um, to make sure that you're keeping these opportunities uh, for uh, not only broad human risk from injury to to a person from an elephant or a primate, which has also happened here in Massachusetts, um, but also from the diseases that they carry with them when they come into our communities. So um, happy to answer any questions that you have and just thank you again for taking the time to take this issue up. Thank you, Laura. Um, at this time, we're going to move to any questions that um, counselors may have. I'm going to put up 
um, the proposed bylaw. Um, on the screen. So, oh, that's the wrong one. I think. No, no, that's the right one. So people should be able to, I'm, I'm gonna make it bigger, just give me a second here. Um, this is the proposed bylaw um, as amended by the proponents that have spoken today. Um, it is not what was in our original council packet. So I just wanted to say that and so for um, committee members, are there, is there any, are there any questions? I see one from Shalini, so Shalini. Yeah, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the work um, that Rebecca Schwartz and um, all the other people have put in to uh, presenting this and their hard work and resilience in getting this very important issue to our attention. Um, and, you know, I mean, some of you might be wondering, like, why, why is this important to Amherst? We don't have anything like this happening over here, and why now? So I do appreciate Laura's mentioning how, this, how animals can be carriers of disease, and, um, and therefore we do need to pay attention to this. But my, when I thought about this issue and why I decided to, um, to sponsor this is, it really comes down to our values as a town. And you know, we might have heard uh, people, leaders speak about this. And uh, I remember Mahatma Gandhi saying, a society is only as strong as its most vulnerable members. And uh, so this is really a question of who we are as a town. And it's not only just this issue. When we have these strong values, we are going to be able to tackle all the other difficult issues at hand as well. So I really take this very seriously. Um, and instead of being reactive, where Right now, we don't have any businesses, but in the future, we could have. Uh, and so this could, uh, we can be proactive about this and set a bylaw, which does not, which sends the message clearly out. And as, as it was mentioned earlier, I think it's going to have ripple effects beyond Amherst, where we really send a message to our neighboring towns that such businesses are just not humane and we do not support to create a world that's humane for all be for all beings. The last thing I wanted to mention is that you know we've received plenty of support from multiple organizations nationally, locally, including Bacon Human um, Society. Um, we have um, what are the others? Pate, how do you pronounce that? Peta? Peta Foundation. Animal Defenders International and so many others, and also our own town, um, very loved animal welfare officer, Carol Hepburn has sent letters of support and has been in communication with this group and supports this um, bylaw. That's all, thank you. Thank you, Shalini. Um, Evan. Yeah, so looking at this and um, I know that when this goes to GOL, they're going to work to put this into the format that our bylaws exist in, Mandy Jo. Um, but looking at um, the content it, through the lens of this committee's charge, um, it, it's sort of interesting because we're sort of dealing a little bit with hypotheticals because as far as I know, um, the types of uh, acts and, and shows that this is trying to cover uh, don't currently come to Amherst, but as Shalini said, we're trying to be uh, proactive instead of reactive. Um, and so it, it seems to me that the list under um, uh, in definitions of wild and exotic animals is really sort of the most important part of this because that's what's telling us what would be allowed and what isn't. And what I see in there is an attempt to um, capture as many species as possible within certain orders, um, but also exempt ones that we would consider to be domestic. Um, and even Rebecca said that we're not trying to, you know, take away the petting zoo on the common with donkeys and, and sheep and stuff. Um, and so the only thing I want to point to is H, which is Artidactyla. Um, I'm thinking in terms of uh, right next door, just over our line, we have the Hadley Barn UMass Livestock Classic that happens uh, every year when we don't have a global pandemic. And I know that like the last time I went to that, um, one, there was a camel there. 
that was um, a resident of one of the participants' farms, a student participant um, who, who brought it to exhibit it. It wasn't being ridden, it was just being uh, exhibited as with all the other livestock. Um, but the second thing that really stood out to me was that Artidactyl would also cover llamas and alpacas, which are not um, exempted here. Um, but are common livestock animals for wool and are common features of livestock exhibitions. So as far as I know, we don't have any livestock exhibitions in Amherst, but if we're, if we're doing this under the guise of gardening for the future, I wouldn't want to uh, create a situation where we couldn't have, um, it, you know, if one of the local farms wanted to do a livestock exhibition uh, and we're allowing cattle and goats and sheep and pigs um, but not llamas and alpacas, which we have just over in the Hadley barn. They have a collection of llamas and alpacas that they raise domestically. Um, so I guess that's the only one I'd, I'd take, I, I have some concerns with is that one. It feels a little bit too broad for me um, because it could potentially encompass some livestock and I don't want to step on any agricultural displays. Thank you. Um, any other counselors with questions um, or comments at this time? We are running up on our deadlines, so um, we will be cutting off this conversation soon and postponing it. We're, we're not going to be finished with it. Um, we will be coming back to it at a later time. Um, I, I do want to bring up some things for me, and then we're going to move to our impact report to see maybe who we might want some advice or input from or questions from. A um, couple of concerns for me. One goes to Evan's point um, and the, the definition of, I think it was traveling show, to me was, was very hard to get my head around. Um, thinking about we have a large university, we have a, a science, you know, science buildings at the university, at the college, we have a natural history museum at the college, we have um, a Hitchcock Center, all of which have live animals for various reasons, some including research, um, and some for because they're rescuing, but they're not probably um, certified under the American Zoo um, Association. And I was having problems figuring out whether the definition of traveling show could include instances of them. Um, you know, if the Natural History Museum at Amherst College has a live animal, I have no idea whether they have any that fall into these categories, but if they did and wanted to take it across campus or to UMass, would this bylaw prevent that? Um, so those are some of the questions I have. Does this bylaw somehow prevent researchers from, you know, no matter what our position on animal research is, there are animals both at UMass and at Amherst College in biology departments um, and potentially other departments. Would this bylaw potentially run into, would they run into issues with this bylaw if we enacted it? So those are some concerns I have. Um, I received a question from another counselor who's not on this committee anymore and um, you know, one of the questions related to UMass and similar to Evan was if UMass wanted to hold a, you know, similar to the UMass barn, but didn't hold it in Hadley, hold it in Amherst because their state, would this bylaw apply to them and would it prevent anyone from going onto UMass's campus and doing something like this? And then another question of does it need to be a bylaw or could it be a resolution? Um, and that's something that we might need to explore, but something I think I want um, maybe Rebecca to respond to as to why the need is for a bylaw versus say a resolution that says we strongly do not approve of these types of acts. Um, what's the benefit of really putting it on the books per se? So that's a question I would like a, a response to quickly and then I think we'll be moving on. Um, so if, Re Rebecca, if you have a response or sure. any thoughts um, on that question? Yeah, I mean, I think a resolution doesn't necessarily hold tight, and I, I'm sure Laura could really speak to this better, but I know that there are um, um, circuses and things like that that try to go into towns, and they have bigger organizations behind them that try to kind of fight to, to make themselves present. Um, Laura, can you 
speak to that? Yeah, it's just there There have been incidences. Uh, we haven't seen it yet here in Massachusetts, but there have been across the country in different localities where um, circuses have either purposefully come to a city or town with the intent of challenging um, the, a local ordinance that is in place or bringing particular animals that are prohibited by a local ordinance, uh, particularly for the, just for the purpose of, you know, fighting it as a as a means of fighting it essentially so um i do think that a uh, uh ordinance rather than a resolution i mean an ordinance has the power of law um certainly it's enforced by a citation with a you know modest monetary fee um but i think that that really is what um, gives the the enforcers the power to say like no and even the the city or town council if it should come before you to say no this is definitely not welcome here it's not a preference um it's actually the, the power of law so i think that that's the importance of doing doing the ordinance rather than a resolution because i think you know a, a, a circus or an exhibitor is not going to be looking they're going to be looking at the law to see if they could come to the town um rather than you know a, a a voice preference by the by the town council they may not even be able to find that you know when they're coming um and working with a group that wants to sponsor them to come to the town um if i can briefly answer the language question that you asked um we did send in some proposed a proposed amendment which would uh which would exempt um, an exhibition that takes place at a non-mobile permanent institution or other fixed facility, provided that the covered animal is not transported to that location for the purpose of such a performance. We, um, that is language that we have been supporting at the state level um, with the goal of exempting uh, 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 zoos, you know, AZA zoos in the area. And so the uh, institutions, the educational institutions would obviously qualify as non-mobile fixed facilities, and they wouldn't be bringing the animals to the facility for the purpose of a performance. As you noted, they would have the animals there for some other purpose, such as research or, you know, something else that's happening at that facility. And so that was our suggestion to make really clear that this is not meant to apply to those types of um, facilities, and that would also uh, cover the museum as a non-mobile fixed, fixed facility, as long as they're not bringing animals there particularly for a performance. And it, of course, would only be limited to the covered animals um, that uh, are listed. Um, and I can say from Humane Society's perspective that having a further conversation about exactly what animals should be exempted as domestic um, is, is certainly something we've done in other cities and towns, you know, just to make sure that that works for exactly what Amherst needs to see. I forgot to unmute. Thank you. Um, any other counselor comments at this time? I'm not going to take us to the community impact report at this time, unless there are any counselors that know exactly that they really want to hear from a certain person i'm willing to entertain that now before we move on otherwise we will find some time in a later meeting to start that conversation and the potential amendments that we're hearing might be desired from the the council and start those conversations with with the the proponents of the bylaw um, I am not seeing any hands for that. I do want to acknowledge that there is a hand in the public that has raised her hand, but we are not in the middle of public comment right now. So that is why I'm not recognizing that hand. But I do want to at least acknowledge that I've seen that, that hand, um, but we are in a public meeting without public comment during this particular item. So um, I encourage, um, I, I think it's Christina Skaringe, um, to to speak with uh, either the proponents or one of us with anything you'd like to add and we'll try and get it into a packet for next whenever our, our next meeting is. Unfortunately, I can't tell our proponents when that will be. It probably will not be at our next meeting in two weeks. It will probably be at least a month away given some of the stuff we're dealing with, but we will work on an agenda to come up with a time to continue moving this forward as time allows during the rest of what's going on. Um, so I wanna thank you all for coming. Um, and presenting um, the bylaw and the reasons for its need and all of that. It has been very helpful to me um, and I'm sure to the rest of the committee. And you guys are welcome to stay on for the rest of the meeting or you guys can leave. You don't have to sit through the rest. Um, and at this time, we will be moving on 
to agenda item. Oh, yep. So thank Sorry. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Um, we will be moving on to agenda item 4A, which was referred to us last night to hear this. This is the economy, the proposal to expedite permitting of local business requests. There was one item in that proposal referred to us last night. I am going to see, um, I'm not going to share my screen exactly right now. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of update of things that have been going on between last night and two o'clock today. Um, and that is attempting to schedule the required Mass General Law public hearing on this matter. Um, and right now, um, I have heard from two of our members, the rest of our counselors. Um, we are looking at June 10th for the public hearing that is required under Mass General Law at 6.30 p.m. on when it's a Wednesday evening, joint with the other we will have a quorum there if we call it for June 10th at 6.30. I, if you cannot make it, please raise your hand in the participant button thing. I am seeing none that will be able to have a quorum. That is very, very good news. Um, so the plan right now is to get those publishes those notices published in the paper to comply with the 14 day requirement to hold the public hearing joint with the planning board on June 10th. We are still waiting to determine whether the planning board can get a quorum on that night it is not one of their normal scheduled meeting times. Um, and I've been in contact with the planning board chair and she believes we'll be able to, but she's still waiting to hear from a few more of her members. Um, so that's that. Um, what would happen is we'll hear this today. The planning board will hear this tomorrow as a preliminary conversation. The hearing would be Jan June 10th um, with a goal of having it at the council meeting on June 15th. That has not been totally confirmed with the president yet. Things are still moving. Um, and uh, one of the questions I'm going to be sending to the town manager is how it works to put potentially put that up for an emergency vote on June 15th for immediate effectiveness June 16th, say, um, the next day, effective the day after we vote, which under an emergency measure is possible, and then also count that meeting as the first required reading under a normal bylaw, and then one meeting later on June 29th have a second required meeting of the bylaw, which then if we pass the identical bylaw under non-emergency measures could then become effective two weeks later, July 12th or 13th or something like that. So, but, but the emergency portion of it, you'd have an effective bylaw as June. This all goes um, of laws. So that's where we stand right now. Um, we're going to have the initial discussion today, see if there's anything more. We have questions from Rob Mora. Um, we have Rob and Christine here about questions. We have Dave Zomek. If we have any questions before we go into that public hearing um, on this proposed bylaw, I see a hand. Shalini. Catch the reason for why it's uh, on June 10th and not June 3rd. Oh, um, sorry, I didn't explain I'm that. Sure. So, uh, Gazette's deadline for publishing tomorrow in tomorrow's paper and legal notice was yesterday at 9 a.m. and they are not willing to waive that and cannot waive that so that we could get it into. And you need to have 14 days notice for a public hearing. So we cannot get it on June 3rd because we have not met the deadline for the Gazette publication. And we cannot or have not are not able to work with us to be able to get it in tomorrow's paper. Mm. Okay. Question, Shalini? You lowered your hand. Um, I do have a question for Rob, since Rob is here. Um, I'm going to take advantage of that. Um, we heard concerns last night, Rob, about uh, the new permits, the new land use permits that this would be able to authorize on, on a, you know, on an administrative matter. And I would just like 
a little more clarification, not necessarily for my own benefit, but as we write reports and for the public's and for the rest of the counselors' benefits themselves, of what couldn't be permitted under this proposed sort of bylaw, Article 14. Um, you know, we had a lot of concerns about, you know, could someone come in and, you know, get something that might not normally pass a, a planning board hearing, say. And so I, I just want to clarify a new building wouldn't fall under this procedure, a new mixed use building wouldn't. Um, so maybe some examples of things that don't qualify to be administratively approved under this proposed bylaw, and then some things that might qualify to be administratively approved, approved might be helpful for us going forward. Sure. Um, it, it's probably uh, easier to talk about what could be approved because it's so limited in its, uh, its scope to the types of uses that are listed in the, in the temporary zoning proposal, uh, which are those retail spaces, uh, retail establishments, food and, and, and drink establishments, and personal care establishments, uh, and, and any of their potential uh, accessory typical accessory type uses like outdoor dining or outdoor sales. Uh, you know, we'll expecting to see more curbside pickup uh, opportunities. But for any of those, those major three major principal uses, the retail food and drink and uh, personal care, uh, this bylaw would allow anything for that type of use to be uh, considered under this bylaw, whether it's a new building, a new space within an existing building, or an accessory use to one of those spaces. Uh, this bylaw does not in, in any way uh, have any uh, use towards um, the other uses of the bylaw, the mixed use category. Last night we heard a question about marijuana uses. That's a completely different section of the bylaw. So it really is uh, focused on, in, on just those three types of uses and their accessory uh, incidental components. So uh, trying to get this straight, a business that might want to build an entirely new, new restaurant building and all in theory in this 180 days would fall under this, but a marijuana establishment that might want to build the exact same building, but the use would be for a marijuana retail business would not fall under this. Am I correct? That's, that, that's correct. That's correct. <laughs> Just trying to figure out the lines. Um, does, do any other counselors have any questions? Um, Shalini. Yes. Um, so firstly, again, thank you so much, Rob and Chris, uh, who worked on this. Good job. So excited. Uh, my question was about pop-ups and would this improve the, the licensing or whatever permitting is necessary to have pop-up retail? I'm guessing it does because it's within the realm of, but just wanted to confirm that. Uh, yes, yeah, so this this is um, uh, very specifically geared towards any of the retail type uses, uh, the grocery stores, any of the other stores, uh, storefront, and also mm -hmm. um, potentially anything that could expand outdoors for retail sales uh, could also be permitted under this this bylaw. Just thank you. I just have one other question. I hoping that we can call it something different than a moratorium because uh, part of this is also, it's a motivation and it's sense of, um, I don't know, um, hope and support. And it's partly marketing, that's my background. So hoping that we can, as we roll it out and in the newspapers and media, we have like a thing that we can use. And I was looking at some other, I'm not saying this is a good one, but in Virginia, this town has something called Rollout Warrington. So it's like a rollout, similar idea of easing the thing. I don't, I don't, I don't put it, but I'm just hoping if we can come up with some more motivating. Yeah, we, we did move away from using a moratorium as a, a way of describing this 
uh, this zoning article and, and took the recommendation of our town attorney on temporary zoning, but certainly uh, because I think that carries a meeting, a meaning in zoning law uh, that is applicable, but uh, certainly from there, you know, the, the, the purpose and intent is uh, open for better description. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? So I am not seeing any. Um, we are not going to be voting on anything today related to this. Um, we would do that after the public hearing on June 10th at that meeting. It sounds it's it's looking like given the lack of questions at this point that we might be ready for a vote that day um, at that meeting to on a recommendation. Um, I'm going to pull up a we're going to share a new one. Um, that was the bylaw. This is our Community Resources Committee process for advising the council. Um, we have, this is a bylaw measure, so I thought maybe we could go through this potentially um, to maybe talk about some stakeholders or um, some impacts this might have um, to try and see if we've gathered everything. Section A is what is the purpose of the CRC review? And that is to make a recommendation, unless anyone disagrees, it's a recommendation to make a recommendation on whether the council should adopt this temporary zoning by law. Um, the identification of initial stakeholders, information needed or prior recommendations, does anyone have um, in either one, two, three, four, or five shown here, any requests for additional information that they may need prior to making a recommendation? Um, is this will be at planning board. We will have a joint meeting with them. So we will be able to hear their recommendation at the same time and discuss it with them. That would be normally one of the ones we'd reach out to and make sure we've heard from. Um, we have our town staff here. Is there anyone else? Shalini and then Christine. I'm happy to have Christine go first. <laughs> okay, Christine. <laughs> So I just wanted to ask if I could get a copy of this document here. Um, I don't know where I would find it on the on the web. So if someone could email me a copy of that document, that would be helpful. I will email it to you. Thank you. I was just, um, should I go? Yes. Yeah. Go ahead, Shalini. Yeah, I was curious uh, to hear from Dave and Rob if they can anticipate what stakeholder um, conflicts might there be like as businesses, and these are all the local businesses that we really want to make sure but can we anticipate uh, what might be some other stakeholders who get affected by this change and can we do something then about that is that clear Christine or Dave? Well, I, defer, I defer to Rob on this, but are you referring to, um, for instance, a butter's uh, potential mm -hmm. complaints? Uh, I know at the council meeting last night, there was a question raised uh, about, you know, kind of competing space in the public way, say on a sidewalk or something like that. I think a lot of these are gonna be on a case by case basis and, uh, mm -hmm. um, a lot of that will be uh, deferred to Rob and Christine's judgment. Um, but, but again, Rob, if you want to chime here with more specifics, happy to have you do that. Well, I, I certainly don't have anything more than that, what you just discussed and what's on this list and, and um, you know, um, or anything that, you know, I haven't thought of anything else that I think would be um, something that we need to be looking out for at this point. You know, one one thing, I mean, I, I don't want to throw this in there unnecessarily, but things like, you know, 
piped piped music, you know, music outside, you know, sometimes concerns people because that travels in in urban settings, etc. Um, you know, that may come up. Um, but a lot of the other, you know, issues that Rob talked about are the considerations about about space, about tables, about separation. Um, you know, all of that would would again go through Rob's office for, you know, not unlike what what um, he has been working, he and his staff have been working on with regard to the uh, farmers market. You know, that entailed, you know, spacing, access, um, you know, um, uh, lanes. You know, people entering here, leaving there. Um, you know, parking, all of that would be considered, whether it's a, a restaurant in the south part of town or, or up in the village center in North Amherst or right, right downtown. And again, it's important to keep, keep in mind, this is for the entire town, not just for downtown. All the village centers, uh, businesses should be able to take, you know, uh, take advantage of, of this if they're interested. I have a question. Um... And it doesn't relate directly to B um, signs. Do sign we we have a zoning sign bylaw somewhere on terms of restrictions on signs in terms of size and locations and stuff like that. Does the permitting around signs fall under this bylaw? And if it doesn't currently, should we consider putting that within the scope of this bylaw since? there may be requests for signs in the public way, no matter how temporary or not to identify open businesses or not, um, or other things like that, um, or to change in sign for some other reason. Uh, so this, for, from the zoning piece, this does include that. So under waivers and modifications, section 8.5 is the uh, the section that allows uh, modification or waiver of any of the sign provisions. So we've incorporated that from the zoning piece. Uh, during the recent uh, update to the bylaws, the signage regulations for portable signs in the public way were removed. So we currently don't have a regulation uh, that exists uh, on those signs or a bylaw that exists for those public way signs. Uh, so I'm envisioning that we will be um, looking at those and authorizing reasonable signage uh, for these types of uses that will occur temporarily uh, during a seasonal outdoor activity, for example. So the, those, since we don't have one regulating in the public way, in theory, that might fall under um, the council's delegation of authority to the town manager to regulate the posting of a sign in the public way or we might want to ensure that it does under a modified bylaw or modified policy there uh, i think we could be clear about that during during that uh that modification to make sure that uh he has that authority otherwise we we at this point assume that he will Thank you. Christine. Well, I just wanted to note that um, for signs on buildings or the typical kinds of signs that we see associated with these uses, we would follow the bylaw in terms of um, the size of the signs and how much of the uh, facade they can cover. So, you know, except in um, unusual circumstances where someone asks for a waiver or where we're talking about signs in the public way, I think we would pretty much stick with what the bylaw already um, tells us. Thank you. Um, I'm not hearing from anyone else anything we need under identification of stakeholders information needed and anything else that exists. This is clearly an entirely new bylaw. There wouldn't be prior recommendations or potentially policies other than, you know, our economic development stuff that we would need to consult. So that moves us into identifying impacts and drawbacks or the SMART method. I think we fall more under impacts and drawbacks. Um, and I just want to quickly go through some of these so that we can identify whether any might be there or that we've at least talked about and touched on some of these because it is a bylaw, even if it does sort of um, sunset in 180 days, it can have significant impact 
on the town. So the first is cultural, natural, and historic. Um, do we have any comments or thoughts on any impacts, benefits, or drawbacks on that? Evan. Uh, this is this is not 100%. This isn't related to an impact, but it your statement triggered something, and I just literally don't know the answer to it. Um, in theory, because this is not tech, it is zoning and it's not. In theory, a restaurant wants to um, alter a business in some way, and that restaurant is by where, you know, Dickinson Street or something like that. Um, how, how does this interact with the local historic district commission? Rob? Uh, the local historic district commission uh, uh, bylaw is in play, would be in play. So those exterior changes in that district would be subject to review by the, by the local historic district commission. So, so the proposal or the suite of proposals essentially exempts them from design review board and planning or zoning board of appeals, but it doesn't necessarily exempt them from all review, depending on where they are. They might still have to go through district commission and they still have to go through board of license commissioners, correct? They would, uh, you know, I mean, it, things in the local historic district that would probably um, occur would be something like uh, signage or, if there was, I can't think of a restaurant uh, that would be there, but if there was a physical change that was, you know, a permanent change, not just furnishings, uh, you know, being set, uh, that could certainly be something that would require the review of the local store district commission. Right. I guess I'm thinking in terms of like the, where uh, lumber yard used to be, which I think is, is a restaurant space, which I think is in the historic district. So, if they wanted to open, they wouldn't necessarily, if a new restaurant wanted to open in the former lumberyard space, they wouldn't necessarily have to go through the planning board or DBA stuff, but they would still have to go through the district commission. If there were changes being proposed to the building uh, that were visible from the public way, yes. Thank you. Any other Questions or thoughts on cultural natural natural historic. That was a good catch, Evan, on that question. We will move on to economic. Um, my guess is we've kind of covered this one that for the current situation, this bylaw would help economic development um, in terms of given the pandemic and the restrictions coming down. Are there any other comments on economic impacts or drawbacks? I am not seeing any. Environment, open space, and recreation. Not everything always applies to everything, but we're going to go through the list. <laughs> I am not seeing anything. Housing and land use. I think that goes to my question of mixed use buildings, apartment buildings, they do not fall under this, this temporary zoning bylaw. So in that sense, this bylaw doesn't really affect my gathering is it doesn't really affect the zoning for those items because they would still be going through the entire process that they currently go through. Any other thoughts on housing or land use? Social, neighborhoods, businesses, noise, visuals. Do we have anything to add? Evan, up, oh, Christine. Um, so I just wanted to say that um, normally when there is um, music offered, you, whether it's um, pre-recorded or live music, the, um, the Zoning Board of Appeals or the Planning Board puts a condition on that says, no more than X decibels at the property line may, may be um, there. So I think that, um, you know, Rob and I would probably come up with um, similar kinds of conditions to prevent, you know, noise from emanating into the neighborhood from a particular location. Thank you. Um, Hi. 
Oh, Shalini. Yes. I just had a clarifying question about that, Chris, that how, what needs to happen to allow more to happen outdoors? Like I think in East Compton or somewhere else where there are a lot of these music events happening. So what, what do we need to do in happen? Yeah, I think you should probably talk to Rob about that. So again, uh, yep, uh, again, zoning, um, you know, we're applying this to the private property locations. So we're not, you know, we're not necessarily looking at this for a potential street closure or, or uh, activities that would occur uh, on the sidewalk or in parking areas if that ends up to be the case. Uh, so what Christine just talked about was uh, a, a 70 decibel maximum at a property line of the private property uh, mm. to, to control the music that is happening on the private property. That's actually criteria that's in the bylaw and we would have that available to us uh, anyway and be using that when we're reviewing these applications. Now, if Paul were to, uh, through the proposal for the use of the public ways, if he was authorizing part of a street to be closed down for dining and that incorporated music that would be all part of his review with input from uh you know the various town officials i would think the police chief might have some thoughts on that and you know i, I would expect there to be uh, uh a cutoff a time where that would end and a, you know a number of conditions that would go along with uh, any consideration like that but i think it would all be available under under these sets of uh, temporary measures. Anything else under noise, businesses, neighborhoods? Not, and um, moving on to sustainability, transportation and facilities. Not seeing any, that takes us to our last one, which is financial. And everyone seems, <laughs> Evan gave me a thumbs up. Um, uh, we, we are also not seeing any comments on that. Um, one last chance, I'm gonna stop this share. Um, one last chance at this time for counselors to ask questions, make comments before we go to a public hearing. Shalini. Yeah, I'm totally trusting that you all have figured this out, but, and when it happens, you will find a way, but I just wanted to put it out there of the challenges that with outdoor dining is going to be that we're limiting the space for people in wheelchairs and accessible. Did we lose Shalini or did I just lose Shalini? Is it just me? Yeah, she's frozen for me too. Okay. Because I, <laughs> um, I know oh. my internet's been doing it. Yeah. Frozen for me. But anyways, okay, so did I what did I miss? You were starting with accessibility and we lost the last half of that. Oh just saying uh, about once we have outdoor dining that they, that would impact wheelchair access. And I'm sure I'm trusting that you will ha have creative solutions for that. Yes? Uh, yes. And in fact, we, we would need to ensure that the location that would possibly be used for any of this activity would be appropriate and allow for not restrict uh, normal pedestrian access or accessibility. Okay. Um, I am not seeing any other comments or anything. As I said, we will not vote on a recommendation until after the public hearing. Um, so at this time, we will move on in our agenda. Um, and that moving on is to, I'm going to skip B for now. We're going to come back to B after we do C, just to ensure that we get through C. Um, which is CRC meeting times adopt a proposed schedule. So give me a second. Um, I need to come up with that schedule. Um, 
this will make it bigger for people is a proposed schedule. Um, it would be good if we could adopt this schedule for now. I recognize that when we talked, we talked about this not this Tuesday time not proceeding past September. Um, but I felt awkward leaving the Wednesday morning times for September, October, November, December, since we will not be doing the Wednesday morning times. So that felt a little disingenuous to leave them on the schedule too. So that's why I, I listed the September, October, November, and December as the Tuesday two to four. Um, but I recognize that that is a potential for changing as we get closer to September. Um, I was optimistic in when we might not be virtual again. We will be virtual probably through the end of August. Um, we will update that as, as we go forward with that. Um, you know, optimism's good. Um, I took it through the end of June. Um, but if we could just vote on the dates, recognizing that the virtual times, you know, virtual or non-virtual, are likely to be changing with the current situation, and we have no idea when the virtual will stop. Um, and if there's any requested changes to these dates, please let me know. Otherwise, we will, I will take a motion to adopt this revised meeting schedule. Uh, Sarah. So I know that it says 8.30 as a starting time, but usually I have chores in the morning, which involves feeding lots of animals and mucking disgusting things out of coops. So it is my hope that maybe we could meet at nine, but I can, I can also try to drag myself out of bed earlier, but I was just putting in a plug for it. So the 8.30, Sarah, is gone. That was prior to April 8th. Um, all the schedule will sh just shows the rest of this year, 2020, not into 2021, and it was all at this point two to four on two. My my little tired self was just making sure that if it ever becomes you know an option again, then I'm putting in that plug. So, thank you. You're so not much. the only one that would love to wait. <laughs> um, Evan is another one, and, and so are I think yeah, everyone's raising their hand. Um, so so that is heard. Um, good for the plug. Any <laughs> other comments on this before? I'll, I guess I'll make the motion to make it easier if I don't see any other comments. So I will move to adopt this um, revised Community Resources Committee meeting schedule that was updated April 22nd, 2020. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Seven seconds. Any other conversation? We will go through a roll call, uh, starting with Shalini. Yes. Evan. Yes. Mandy is a yes. Sarah. Yes. And Steve. Yes. Excellent. That is adopted. We will get that on the calendars and on the website. Um, that will take us back to zoning bylaws. And now I know how much time we have for Item 4B, zoning bylaws to recommend, rend, recommend a plan for approaching zoning bylaw revisions. It was referred to us in November. Um, we're in the middle of zoning bylaw revisions. So <laughs> we're, we're kind of doing it as we talk about a plan. Um, and so we will be on, on another announcement with this. The plan at this point is to, I apologize for all these extra meetings, have attend a meeting on June 3rd with the planning board to discuss this. Um, at 7.30 would be the start time for that. They have a couple of public hearings to hold beforehand. Um, so we would call our meeting to not start at their 6.30 start time so that we don't have to be there during those hearings to just sit. Um, this is a revision to a flow chart that the prior membership of CRC voted to recommend the council adopt. The revisions refer to the first two boxes, which is where my the, the cursor is, this first one and this second one. Um, based on the conversations we had at the last meeting and at prior meetings, and in an attempt to 
work through what might happen before we get to sort of the hearing stage and the formal what essentially happened last night at the council meeting an actual set of bylaw revisions or a new bylaw that's in near final form ready for a hearing wanting to go um and so this was an attempt my attempt to put that into writing however poorly it has been done um we are to give you an example on this chart of where we are the zoning bylaw for um the article 14 that we just discussed today is now in these dotted lines planning board review process and crc review process headed quickly for a public hearing and then going to be moving through all of that very quickly the um and it started pretty much at council receives a proposed zoning bylaw amendment um, from the planning staff um the other one we're talking about holding a hearing on june 17th for which is the quant voting quantum for site plan review is still in sort of this new phase here um, we heard from staff, we talked a little bit about it. We don't have final language yet. It hasn't been to the council. The goal is to have that at the council on June 1, which would formally start this process so that we can get to hearing on June 17. Um, so that's where sort of some of them are. Others are still back in, in these phases here with some discussion um, with or without CRC involvement at this time, particularly 40R is in a very preliminary stage at the planning board. So thoughts on these two additions to this chart. Gotta get my participant window back up. Y'all are not talkative today. Christine. Um, I received a, um, a form of this chart that was not stable. And um, I wonder if I could get a PDF of it because- You can get the PDF, yes. Um, the PDF is in the packet for today, but I will forward you the PDF too. Thank you. Um, Evan and then Shalini. Yeah, so um, I want to, so when I was looking at the packet and I looked quickly at this chart, I didn't realize that it had been revised since we last saw it. I, I just, I opened it and I went, oh my God, I've read this chart like 15 times. I don't need to read it again. So um, part of my silence has been, I'm reading it in real time. And so I guess I, I'm curious, um, to share a little bit about the reason for the revit, like what what the the purpose of it was. What, one thing that maybe jumps out to me, but maybe this isn't true, because again, I'm, I'm literally just reading and thinking about it in real time, is it feels like it, it moves uh, zoning amendments a little bit more into the realm of the council and away from the planning board, which I think sort of aligns with what we were hearing uh, from from Northampton a little bit, um, and also sort of reflects, I think, something that Dave said last meeting, which was this feeling that planning board is <laughs> members are overworked, and perhaps the development of revisions, um, in addition to all of the things they do, might be a bit much. But maybe that's not the intent of this. So I'm just curious. So. I'll try to respond to that and then Shalini just unraised her hand, but um, it's, it was, and it, it wasn't necessarily an attempt to remove anything from the planning board because that's not really where I was going. It was an attempt to take the information we received last meeting, the information Dave was talking about, the thoughts and sort of the what I felt I was getting from this committee in terms of prior proposals or other things to try and better write down how 
prioritization of various um, proposals might happen. So more of how do you actually signal what the council may want to be prioritized. Um, and that, you know, we've been hearing that the planning board wasn't sure where the priorities lied. Um, you know, they, you know, and whether or not that is absolutely true or not, but that's some of the things we've been hearing that they wanted to get moving, but they weren't sure what the council wanted them to move on. Uh, they didn't have a lot of direction. Um, and so, you know, there was this sort of gumming up of something somewhere. And so I took sort of what conversations we've been having and said, well, how could we potentially ungum that system? And this is, you know, basically based on something David said, um, he had suggested that the planning staff come to a CRC meeting to talk about what they'd like to see or what changes are there and get an idea from and a feeling from the CRC committee where those priorities might be. Um, as chair of CRC, I felt very uncomfortable with that being only the sole realm of CRC um, because, you know, I, I felt that would not be well received by the rest of the council if the only people receiving those sort of initial presentations were the five members of CRC. And um, in talking to the council president, we thought maybe an initial very broad overview of potential changes that could be useful and all could start at the council level to get a broad idea of where the council might be feeling and going and leaning towards on those priorities to be able to give that direction to both CRC and the planning board and the planning staff. So that's sort of where this came from and what the intent is on some of this, which is why you'll see in the very first one that it's the council hearing the presentations um, to then attempt to give some priority. But the presentations are not necessarily direct actual wording changes. It's hey, we could, you know, we know that this part of the bylaw is not working right, and we know that this part's not working right, but we only have time to do one, which one might, you know, something like that um, was the thinking. I hope that clears it up. Christine and then Sean. So I just wanted to say that I think the planning board would benefit from hearing from the CRC about what um, the CRC and the town council think is important. The planning board already has a list of things that they think are important and we've shared it with you um, and they are happy to start working on those things but they also want to have um, some sense that the things that they think are important are the things that people who are going to vote on it will think are important and so the effort that they put in will be you know, will bear fruit in the end so there, there just needs to be some kind of a communication between the planning board and CRC and town council. And I think this is a good start. And this doesn't preclude, um, doesn't preclude uh, issues coming from the planning board to town council, um, just like they uh, did go to um, the select board and the town meeting, but it kind of um, brings the CRC more into the conversation. And so I think it, this is gonna be a good thing. Colony. Since we don't have Rob here all the time, I just want, I would love to hear from Rob and who also has a lot of experience with these issues real time. If you would, I would love to hear what you think help with this, this process to make it more expedient, more effect, efficient, efficient and effective. Uh, well, I think it's a little of all of this. So, um, you know, certainly having the plan on um, and priorities laid out, uh, you know, helps us decide where to focus our energy and, and, and move things in the right direction. But I, I you know, um, consistent with what uh, Christine mentioned, I think this is uh, uh, helpful. This just adds to that uh, in, in providing a better, more clear uh, expectation for where uh, priorities should be set. Thank you.
Any other comments, um, questions, thoughts from the counselors, the committee members? Evan. So I'll just say having now read it and heard um, the explanation in the background, um, this seems very rational to me. And I think that it definitely provides some clarity in, in a situation that's been admittedly a bit murky over the past year and a half. Uh, so I, I would be supportive of, of these revisions. Okay, thank you. Um, Dave, and then Sarah. Am I unmuted? You are good. Yeah, I had two comments. One was um, just on the first. Is that, is that me making that noise? No, I think it's Steve. Ah, uh, um, um, my first comment is on the the first um, the first block. Town Council here's presentation on potential bylaw revisions. Um, so. You know, I, I really am supportive of that because I, I, I think I think we've heard for weeks, if not months, that you know the planning board would like more direction from the council, staff would like more direction from the council. But part of me thinks um, there's two two elements that I see to that presentation. One is, you know, what does what does Rob, what do Rob and Christine see as some of the the weaknesses in our zoning bylaw, the, the antiquated sections, the problematic sections, and how do we become more kind of proactive looking at where the town needs to go. But the other piece is I, we all know, I think we all know full well that council members have their own ideas about what the priorities are. So to me, in advance of that meeting, it would be very helpful if, um, if the president of the council really you know, requested from council members that you, each of you provide some, either come to the meeting prepared to speak on what your priorities are, or in advance, send Lynn some thoughts on what you think the priorities are. Because I, I think there's, there's, there's a benefit to having you respond to what Rob and Christine think are, you know, uh, shortcomings in our, our zoning bylaw or opportunities for the future. But I also think you all have your own ideas. So so there, I really see it to be most effective that first meeting would be both hearing from Rob and Christine, but also hearing from individual council members and not just responding to what Rob and Christine say. So that's one, one piece of it. The other thing is, Mandy Jo, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, this was all in development before Rob and Christine came up with the proposal for the new approach to zoning, uh, you know, this 180 day approach to try to jumpstart our, our village centers in downtown. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about dates and, you know, when would we be talking about bringing this, you know, having this initial meeting with the council in the context of the, you know, response, uh, the COVID-19 response to zoning? Um, I know at, from, from, um, putting my vice president hat on, um, Lynn and, and my as my chair hat, I brought this to Lynn as a po possibility given talk last week. And we were hoping to roll this into sort of this initial presentation into also the bid and chambers sort of requests for COVID into one big sort of zoning type um, talk at the next council meeting on June 1st. I do not know whether that will stand um, given that we've already received some potential changes to respond to COVID um, from, from Rob and Christine that are fantastic in terms of the responsiveness and all. Um, so I, I haven't had a chance to talk to the president, uh, Lynn, about that initial plan to start this conversation on this chart on June 1. This won't be in front of the planning board until June 3 with us and the planning board speaking to hopefully on June 3 get to two votes, one from the planning board and one from the CRC on a formal recommendation of this modified flow chart for sort of how things might go. Um, does that answer the questions, Dave? Yeah, I'd just like to hear from or give Rob and Christine a little opportunity to think about you know, whether June 1st is realistic 
you know, after yesterday's announcement from the governor, we can feel a momentum certainly picking up around here in terms of the volume of inquiries and questions. How do I get going? You know, I'm in this category that can open at 25% or 100% or whatever. So I just want to be realistic with Rob and Christine's time. And I would, I would defer to them whether, you know, they can prepare for the public meeting and they can do all the things that they need to do. And is June 1 realistic for them? So I'd leave it up to them if you want to comment, Rob or Christine. Um, I can I can suggest that it's probably not going to be good uh, for me uh, with uh, what I'm expecting and hoping that we'll be uh, working on during that time frame. Uh, but I haven't talked about that specifically with Chris yet. Chris? Uh, I think we do have a lot on our plates. Um, in addition to responding to, to the COVID issues, we're also starting to receive a flood of applications from um, people who want to get started on things again. And so, um, you know, I'm predicting both the Planning Board and the Zoning Board of Appeals are going to be pretty busy with applications and other um, committees will also be busy with applications. So we have that on one side. We have the COVID issues on uh, another side. And then a third side, I guess, is um, how to approach zoning in general. So I would say um, I could be ready for a discussion of this uh, flow chart here on June 1st, but I wouldn't have time to. about how we propose June 1st, but I'm not sure that's what you're expecting. Okay, um, what I will do is that I will take that information to the president. The flow chart was temporarily tentatively on June 1st for a first reading, it requires two. Um, and obviously we're not going to vote before we've had a meeting with the planning board. Um, but I was, I was potentially, but, but given everything going on, I, I will let the president know that, um, an actual large presentation from planning staff on potential zoning revisions and bylaw revisions is not something that can be done on June 1st, um, given everything else going on. Um, yeah, and I, could I just add, I mean, I think the goal here is to get the short-term zoning relief done as quickly as possible. Let's not detract from that in any way, shape, or form. Council, committees, uh, staff, bid, chamber, all of us working to try to get that passed. And then hopefully we could flow right into, you know, this This is really the mid to longer range and and um, you know we can we can look at some dates where it would be more convenient for Rob and Christine to prepare something more robust. Have the chamber and bid come in. Any you know any anyone else who wants to support or ask questions about you know this flowchart, et cetera. So, thanks. Okay. Any other thoughts, comments from the councilors? Sarah, you had your hand up at one point, I believe. <clears throat> Yeah, so I was just going to say, since I've been quiet for the whole meeting, that most of this sounds, you know, really good to me. And I think that having CRC um, act as sort of um, an agent of the council to work more closely with uh, planning and the planning board, um, planning staff is excellent. And I think that um, closer communication and working together is fantastic. Um, I'm also going to say just, and I'm going to say this as a person from District 1, I think that um, having some time to sort of think through, and I think as Shalini said, sort of how we use wording or how we present things is going to be really important. Um, because I think as we sort of maybe um, start to get into uh, sort of changing how maybe zoning is done or bylaws are done, there are going to be some people who hear like a shorter time span is something that's negative. Um, as opposed to positive. So maybe just giving it a little bit of, of extra time, even if it's just a week or two weeks to try to think about that would be a good idea. Thank you for those comments. Anything else from individuals? Uh, Shalini. Thank you, Sarah. I agree with what you said. This is a comment that's not directly related, but something that Dave said, and it's going back to our earlier, what we're going to call 
Viola and you, Dave said something about jumpstarting businesses and I was thinking jumpstart Amherst as <laughs> jumpstart Amherst as the sort of that campaign that we're doing all businesses or something like support small business or something that is more proactive and and it kind of communicates the essence and meaning of what we're trying to do rescue and provide relief to our small businesses. I like jumpstart. Jumpstart Amherst. Okay, not seeing any other comments. We are going to, again, there won't be a vote tonight, um, today. That will happen later after we've had our meeting with the planning board. That takes us to minutes. Um, we have two sets of minutes to approve. Um, let me, I, I need to pull these up because I have some requested changes myself. So the first set is May 5th minutes. Um, and the changes are fairly basic here. Um, the first one is to get rid of the directions on public comment is one of my recommended changes. The second you can see here, instead of legislative board um, council um, from Jim Nash. Um, and then I just fixed a little bit of that one sentence there, the guide, the revisions to the zoning bylaws. A couple of just, you know, Scrivener type things. Um, and then, then a comment on the items, the 11.25 proposed amendment to add similar to um, what we discussed in terms of where we were leaning. And those were my changes to that. Um, Shalini, you had your hand up at one point. Mistake. Okay. <laughs> Any other requested changes to this set of minutes, May 5th? Okay, I am seeing none. We're gonna do these as a one full vote. The next set of minutes is our April 21st minutes. Um, and these were a joint meeting of the town council and CRC. Um, at a, listed were absent were DeAngelis and Dumont, but they actually did show up at some point during the meeting. So I, I put them into counselors present. Um, and then I'm not sure if there were any other, these are a long set. I think that might be the only set of changes that I had. Did any, that is the only set of changes I had, it looks like. Did anyone else have any changes to the April 21st minutes? I am seeing none. So that means I will make the motion to adopt the April 21st, 2020 minutes and the May 5th, 2020 minutes as amended. Is there a second? Second. Shalini seconds that. Uh, any other comments, questions? We will roll call. Um, we will start with, are we going to start with this time? We'll start with Steve. Yes. Um, and Evan. Yes. And Sarah. Yes. And Shalini. Yes. And Mandy is a yes. That is unanimous. So we are done with minutes. That takes us to announcements. Um, the announcements are we are adding a whole bunch of meetings that are joint meetings with the planning board. Um, as chair, I apologize for adding double meetings 
lots of weeks in a row and three extra meetings on Wednesday nights, June 3rd, for a discussion on the flowchart we just discussed. June, that one would be 7.30 is the estimated start time for that discussion um, per uh, Christine Graymel on the planning board chair. June 10 for a joint meeting on the Article 14 proposed zoning bylaw on temporary zoning. And June 17, again at 6.30 for a joint meeting on the revisions to zoning bylaw section 11.250, which is the site plan review voting quantum. Those are all generally tentative, but please put them in your calendar. Um, the June 3rd and June 10 are pretty much confirmed almost. I will certainly let you know when they are fully confirmed. We are, as I said, for June 10, waiting to ensure that the planning board can have a quorum that night so that we can go forward with that. June 17 will be confirmed in about a week as long as we have the language we need from the attorney barred um, on that revision. Um, those are the extra meetings. Because they are extra, I will try to keep the CRC meetings slightly shorter so that we are hopefully not too overburdened. Um, I don't think I have any other announcements. Does anyone else have any announcements before I move on to next agenda item preview or next agenda preview? I am not seeing any. On the next agenda, we will be taking up master plan chapter three land use for potentially the final near final time. I'm not sure, we'll see. Um, the planning board is taking that up tomorrow night. Um, and so hopefully by June 2nd, we will have a better idea of where that amendment sits as we move forward and we can dispense with that potentially in terms of get that one ready to go and then ready to sit until we have the rest of the master plan. Um, Christine, do you want to comment on that one? Yes. Um, so this, uh, tomorrow night, I'm bringing the master plan to the, um, planning board for the first time. They've actually had it since March. Um, but I haven't discussed it with them. I've certainly discussed it with the chair and I have one set of comments from one of the planning board members but I don't have um, comments from other planning board members. So I'm just um, making you aware that um, I think it may take more than one night to um, figure out what the planning board thinks about the approach that I'm taking to update the master plan. Um, it could be that they're fine with it and they'll resolve their issues tomorrow night, but we have a couple of other things on our agenda. So I'm, I'm not as um, optimistic about that. Just okay. That is good to know. Thank you for that. We will, I, I will be in touch through Dave and all to ensure that if it, it, that it's ready for that agenda. If not, we will put it on the next one. Um, and make sure we're ready for it if we are. Um, we will, I think the two things we dealt with today will not be on the next agenda because we're waiting for planning board joint meetings. Um, that leaves us with a couple of action items. Um, we have the Wild Animal Act we can bring in. We have the noise bylaw that has also been referred to us. And we have a housing um, priorities policy, comprehensive housing policy referral outstanding. Um, and so as we deal with zoning bylaws, we also have those other three things to continue to deal with. Um, I would love to hear from the members as to priorities on those three outstanding, depending on whether we have time to fit any of that onto upcoming agendas. Evan. I feel like we can probably dispense with the noise bylaw pretty quickly, even though I know you and I are gonna fight over it, Mandy. Um, so I kind of feel like we should prioritize that because then we can, I think we could do it quickly and then we can just get rid of it. Okay. Any other thoughts on those three items? Shalini. Yeah, same as Evan. I think these are the, the animal bylaw and this noise one are simple ones that we can tackle within just get them out and then we can focus on the house of one. Any other thoughts from the committee members? 
I will take that all into consideration as we try to come up with an agenda for the next meeting. Um, are there any items not anticipated 48 hours before this meeting that weren't on the agenda that anyone feels should be brought up? Seeing none, I am going to thank everyone for a very efficient meeting that I was not expecting to be able to get through that whole agenda. Um, so I appreciate that we were able to do that um, and to move some of that stuff along. I want to thank Christine and Rob for all of your time and hard work, especially on this temporary zoning bylaw. I know that took a lot of effort and time and new thinking um, and innovative thinking to see what we can do for our businesses and to get it moving so that we can get it enacted, hopefully, if it is enacted, and I'm hoping it will be, it seemed to get a, pr a, pre a pretty good review um, and reception at the council in time for the phased opening that the governor seems to do so that it can actually do some real good for our businesses in town. So I wanna thank you guys for your time in all of the prep work and also for spending the time with us to answer all those questions. Um, seeing no other hands and no other items, I am going to adjourn the meeting at 3.51 p.m nine minutes early. Thank you all. <laughs>